my Adore, my 64, my Commodore 64. Hi there, and welcome to a Let's Type episode from the Commodore 64 Appreciation Society. This is a series where I reach back into the past and type out a program from an old computer magazine, and then when I finish typing it in, I play it. March 1986 was a lively month. Microsoft went public, instantly triggering decades of if only I'd bought shares regret. Guns N' Roses inked the record deal with Geffen, proving that calling yourself Slash wasn't tantamount to career suicide, and Molly Ringwald continued her domination of 80s teen cinema with Pretty in Pink sitting atop the box office. Meanwhile, the Commodore 64 wasn't fading away. It was thriving. Even as 16-bit machines arrived and people whispered about its demise, the 64 still commanded nearly a third of the U.S. home computer market. And with the sleek Commodore 64C just months from release, owners had every reason to feel confident. This was also the peak of the type-in era. Magazines like Compute, Compute's Gazette, and Run were at the height of their circulation, and the programs hitting the newsstands were more polished than ever. Cheap discs and faster machines would eventually end the party, but in 86, type-ins were still a rite of passage. Today's game is a great snapshot of that moment. Switchbox from the March 86 issue of Compute. This one was a viewer's suggestion. Thanks, Bill. And it also happens to be one I remember very fondly. I'm excited to dive in. All right, enough scene setting. Let's get into Switchbox. Switchbox was written by Todd Highmark, who was an assistant editor at Compute at the time. And that's interesting for a couple of reasons. For starters, this is the first program I've typed in that wasn't submitted by an outside developer. It was common for Compute staff to adapt reader-submitted programs to other platforms, but this one appears to have been developed in-house from the start. And that should bode well. The editors at Compute were professional programmers who knew these machines inside and out. So I'm expecting tight code, fewer rough edges, and hopefully a really solid game. Compute describes Switchbox as an electronic pachinko game. And visually, that comparison makes sense at first. Pachinko is pure luck. You drop a ball at the top and watch it bounce off pegs until it lands wherever it lands. No skill involved. Switchbox may look similar, but that's where the comparison ends. This is very much a game of skill and strategy with no luck involved at all. The goal is to set up chain reactions by dropping balls onto platforms while also preventing your opponent from doing the same. Success comes from understanding how the balls move through the board and knowing when to push for points and when to hang back and wait for a better setup. It's one of those games that takes a few rounds to really click, but once it does, it quickly becomes challenging and competitive. Switchbox makes heavy use of Petski graphics, which is great. They look fantastic on screen and they're very much a part of the Commodore 64's identity. The downside is that Petski heavy programs can be a real pain to type in, especially when you're using an emulator like Vice. Vice does an excellent job of emulating the computer, but emulating the Commodore 64's keyboard is another story entirely. If you're not familiar with it, the 64 keyboard is very different from what we're used to today. Many keys are in different places, and most keys also produce graphics characters when combined with Shift or the Commodore key. For example, Pressing Commodore and the asterisk key produces a triangle, something that doesn't map cleanly to a modern keyboard at all. The result is that entering Petski from a magazine listing often means constantly switching between symbolic and positional keyboard layouts in Vice, sometimes multiple times within a single line, like this one here. It's all doable, but it's slow, fiddly, and very easy to make mistakes. Thankfully, this listing uses Compute's automatic proofreader, so even if entering a line takes a while, at least I know when I've finally gotten it right. <laughs> and right on cue, here's a line that I just can't get right. I've typed line 680 in very, very slowly, at least five times now, and the proofreader still won't accept it. It's loaded with Petsky characters, but as far as I can tell, everything looks correct. At this point, it's getting more frustrating than productive, so I'm going to leave it for now and come back to it later. Huh. 
Well, this is interesting. It turns out compute added an extra character to line 1080. Specifically, this question mark here, which clearly doesn't belong. And sure enough, once I remove it, the checksum matches perfectly. That got me thinking, what if there's a typo on that other line, the one that was giving me so much trouble? Yep, that was it. When I first typed in line 680, I remember thinking that this period looked a bit odd, but I didn't really have a reason to question it. And sure enough, it turns out that it was a typo. I'm sure that tripped up a lot of people back in 1986, possibly myself included. Compute later published typo corrections for the Atari and Apple versions of the game, but as of the November issue, six months later, neither of these errors had been corrected for the 64. And I can almost understand why. The extra question mark in line 1080 is obvious. It either gets fixed while typing or it triggers a syntax error pretty quickly. But the typo in line 680 is more subtle. It makes the interface look a bit odd, but it doesn't actually break the game. My guess is that a lot of people just played it that way and never thought twice about it. Still, it's kind of surprising that it was never officially corrected. Okay, with all those problems out of the way, I got through the rest of the program without many more issues at all. I made a couple of mistakes here and there, but the proofreader caught them. And the program wasn't particularly huge to begin with, just 108 lines to be exact. But we're done, and I'm pretty confident that this should work on the first try, especially considering that I've already looked ahead in future issues for error corrections, and there weren't any. Alright, and Switchbox is saved. <laughs> On disk, we can see that it takes up 17 blocks, which is just a bit over 4K. So yeah, definitely not a big program. Okay, no fancy title screens or anything, but that's cool. Switchbox is ideally a two-player game, but I'm flying solo today, so let's try a test run between me and my cat, Spoon. She's cute, but not that bright, so I think I have a good chance of winning. Nice, the board looks perfect. I'll start with a ball on the platform in column four. Balls will sit on those platforms until pushed off or the trigger is hit beside it, like there. The basic idea is to arrange the balls to cause a chain reaction. I'll trigger one here and you'll see what I mean. Hitting the triggers also causes the switch to flip, hence the name Switchbox, and that becomes a significant part of the strategy. <laughs> and of course it's Spoon who gets the points. My cat is kicking my butt. The goal of this round is to get 10 points, which is indicated at the top of the screen. I've set up another chain reaction here, which should give Spoon enough points. Once a player reaches the target, their opponent gets one final move before the round ends. <laughs> yeah, I won't be able to get enough points here, so Spoon wins the round. Great job, Cat. But this has been great. The game works perfectly, and I'm remembering how much fun it is. Simple rules combined with complex outcomes always makes for a good game. Okay, let's restart it, and I'll use the solitaire rules to play against the computer. Interestingly, there isn't really a computer opponent in the game. There's no intelligence built into it at all. Instead, the developer created a set of rules to make it adequately challenging when playing alone. Pressing the plus key drops a ball in a random location, which is what we'll do on the 64's turns. The computer goes first and keeps playing random balls until it scores. I'm able to skip my turns with the minus key. This generally makes for a fun setup with balls all over the place, and I'm just hoping that it doesn't get really lucky. It's a fun set of rules. Man, is the board ever getting loaded up. Oh, 
Oh, cool. The computer is going to get a couple of points here. Okay, I'm up. I feel like there's a good chain reaction over there on the right. And yeah, there we go, eight points. So after my turn, the computer then plays random balls until it scores again. <laughs> nice, great job, 64. Uh-oh. I'm not going to get any points here, and I've loaded up the middle really nicely. <laughs> yeah, it felt like that was going to happen. I get one more turn, though. but no dice. Okay, that's the end of round one. That row of four numbers shows the scoring. The first row is the points you earned during the round. The second row is a bonus. If you reach the target score, you get the target value added to your points. The third row is another bonus based on the difference between our scores. The winner gains the difference, the loser has it subtracted. And the final number is simply the total of everything above. So at the moment, the 64 is beating me 58 to 18. I'm off to a great start. But this is a good chance to catch up. Round two uses Fibonacci scoring, so the values increase as you move towards the edge of the board. That shifts the strategy quite a bit, and with the 64 playing randomly, it does work in my favor. I loaded up the right side of the board and started a good chain reaction. Check out those points. Nice haul. I've hit the target, so the 64 gets one final turn. Under the solitaire rules, I choose the drop instead of leaving it to luck. Column 3 looks like the best option, but there just aren't many points on the board, so this round's mine. Oh wow, check out those points. That's more like it. Round 3 is a low scoring one, with relatively few points available and a target score of only 20. Which I reach first, but the computer has a final turn and there are a lot of balls out there. This one's going to be close. But I pulled it off and have a really good lead heading into the final round. Round 4 is a big one. The target is 80 and there are a lot of points on the board. This is the squares round. I gambled a bit and really loaded up the right side. And here comes the payoff. <laughs> nice. Take that, 64. For the computer's last turn, I really have just one choice, column 1. And wow, that was more than I thought it would get. But I still won by a mile. <laughs> now I just need to find Spoon and try to beat her this time. Twitchbox is everything I remember it to be. The design is excellent, simple rules that lead to surprisingly complex outcomes. And as expected, it's a very efficiently programmed game at only 4K, and there's plenty of room to add more features if you want.
It's a terrific example of what made these magazine games so special. For just a few dollars, these magazines offered an incredible amount of value, and as we've seen again here, some genuinely excellent games. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider leaving a like or subscribing. And if you have any experiences with Switchbox or typing in your own programs, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Hope to see you again.